What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. So we're right at the start of the Persona 25th anniversary. It's going from September all the way until next fall. Yeah, it's gonna be quite the celebration apparently, but it looks like one announcement may have leaked out a bit early and it has Persona fans right now saying, it's about time, we're gonna go over that one here today. Also, we are gonna be talking about the Japan sales numbers from this past week, showing the PlayStation 5 in a really tough spot. And we're also gonna be going over another fun little tidbit from that Xbox Power On series, going over how Bill Gates responded to the Wii craze. Guys, if you enjoyed these videos, make sure that like button helps out a ton. And if you're new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below and ring that notification bell so you can keep up to date with all of the uploads here on the channel. And we're gonna start today with Elden Ring. It's close, a couple months away, we'll finally be playing what, I mean, feels like one of the most hyped up games that I've seen in a long time. But how about we make that two month or so wait feel more like a Souls game. We can see this uh, from Lance McDonald on Twitter saying, because PlayStation 4 firmware 9.00 has been publicly jailbroken now, some number of Elden Ring spoilers will be data mined from the network test version over the coming days. Please be respectful to patient fans and to From Software in sharing these. That's right, some images are already starting to pop up online after that network test. People have started to sort through the different files. Now, the thing with this is Lance does mention in a follow-up tweet that while some of those images are getting out there of potential enemies or late game bosses, people are sort of making up their own descriptions of it. So what you may be reading as a plot spoiler might just be fan fiction. So this is gonna be tough because we're still months out from it and we're already starting to see spoilers show up online. So there you go. It's gonna be, not, like I said, a, a Souls game over the next couple of months trying to avoid all of this, whether it's on Twitter with the timeline and images popping up or even YouTube turning on you and just dropping the thumbnail there and recommended video. So good luck out there to everyone, especially people who have been waiting so long for Elden Ring. Here's hoping you can uh, keep the blinders on until then. Also, we had a new trademark that was spotted on a game I hadn't really thought too much about for a while now. It came out back in 2015, and that's the Order 1886. We can see Gamatsu spotting it, saying Sony Interactive Entertainment filed a trademark for the Order 1886 in the US on December 9th. Now, these trademarks do a very good job giving people hope, and most of the time, I usually err on the side of business as usual for that company, whether it's Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, whoever, they're just trying to keep the rights to specific like trademarks here and kind of renew or re-up anything they have to as they go along. But I will say it would be, I think interesting to see them do something else with the Order 1886. I don't know if they would do like a remaster to the PS5, similar to what they're doing here soon with Uncharted, or if they would do a full sequel to it. The, the issue we run into is Ready at Dawn made that video and they're with Facebook or Meta and Oculus now. So Sony would have to find a different studio to work on the Order 1887. That's kind of one of the reasons I'm looking at this and saying, trademark, business as usual, just keep the rights to it and they're moving on. But yeah, it would be kind of interesting to see what they could do with that series because it was at least impressive at the time when it came to the visuals. I understand it didn't review well, didn't really set the world on fire, but what could they do now with a new Order 1886 game with the PlayStation 5? Oh, and while we were talking about all of those different games from that Indie World Showcase, it looks like there was one other game that quietly got somewhat announced for the Switch through the ESRB ratings board. We can see this over on Twitter from Mabellion saying, considering it was not part of Indie World, it appears Remnant from the Ashes is headed to Switch as it has been rated by the ESRB. I have not played through this game at this time. I think Evan actually went through it and he seemed to enjoy it quite a bit. It is like four player co-op action adventure RPG style game. It looked pretty good at the time. I just never got to it. So I guess it would be kind of cool to see it announced here for the Switch as well. Why not? It seemed to perform well. I think it did over a million units sold. So for them, that's, that's pretty good there. But uh, like the fact that it's been rated by the ESRB means that it's most likely gonna be announced for the Switch at any time. So just keep your eyes open for an announcement at some point. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with this apparent leak that's happened from Atlas and Sega. This around that Persona 25th anniversary where we're supposed to be getting announcement like every month or so, something that could be small or something that could be relatively large, like say Persona 4 Golden, going to another platform. Originally it was just on the Vita and it sold really well there for the most part based on the Vita's install size, I would say it did 
pretty well. But then they did port it over to PC where it actually surprised Sega and Atlas. I, we've talked about this quite a bit and how ridiculous that sounds, right? Wow, people wanted to buy Persona 4 Gold and it was on the Vita this whole time. Why didn't they buy it there? Because no one really bought a Vita. Let's be real with, with that one. But let's take a look at this tweet here. This is from Scramble saying, adding after the P4AU or Persona 4 Arena Ultimax website address shows the Midnight Channel Collection for PS4 and Switch. The Midnight Channel Collection is the Persona 4 Arena Ultimax and Persona 4 Golden combined. Archive page of the V2 version from five days ago doesn't have it, almost like they're setting up the website for an announcement that would be coinciding with this 25th anniversary. And it makes sense. I think most of us look at the Persona situation and we're just not really sure what's going on there. It's never been publicly stated that Sony had some sort of investment or exclusivity for the Persona series, but seems pretty obvious that they must, especially around Persona 5. Although Persona 5, it's sold well for just being on the PlayStation 4 and the PlayStation 5. Would it sell better being on PC and on the Switch? And sure, even on Xbox, you know what? They could probably collect a bag from Microsoft just to get it onto Game Pass. So yeah, they would probably make quite a bit more money putting it everywhere they can. I think the biggest test though will be Persona 6. I almost feel like they've kind of moved on from Persona 5 being ported to other platforms now and that's their main focus currently. So if Persona 6, 6 gets announced and it's just on PlayStation, then yeah, there's probably some sort of deal and that'll be reflected certainly with those uh, Japan sales charts we're gonna go over here soon. But Persona 4 Golden strikes me as one that they would have no problem moving around to other platforms. It just, they didn't, it, to them, it seemed like it wasn't a game that that many people were interested in and then they moved it to PC and they said to investors, okay, we get it. We're gonna start looking around at some of our legacy software and see what we can do about porting them to other platforms. And this, like I said, lines up perfectly with the Persona 25th anniversary that they are doing all these announcements for. It's set up on the website, just kind of hidden right now. And do I think that Sega and Atlas would accidentally leak something like this? Yes, like what did we just see with Sonic? I know we talk about Atlas as like they're separate from Sega. Sega owns Atlas. So I, I just see that as, yeah, that's, that's something I, I would expect actually from either of them at this point. So we'll see what happens here in the coming months. I mean, it was already weird that it wasn't on the PlayStation and it makes sense to also go to the Switch. A lot of people look at the Switch as like the successor to the Vita. So across the board, I'm sure it would do very well for Atlas and Sega to move Persona 4 Golden around, a game that a lot of people probably just didn't have access to, at least until recently on the PC. But even then there are a lot of people who would just wanna play it on their Switch or on their PlayStation and why not? Make a bunch of money from a game you developed a while ago and you just have to port it around. So we'll keep an eye out for this announcement, but something tells me it's uh, it's coming up here soon. Next up, let's talk about the Japan Famitsu sales charts that really shows a tough situation right now for Sony and the PlayStation 5. At least that's how it looks from the outside. Let, let's take a look at the charts first, starting with the games. The top 10, they are all Switch titles. Pokemon Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl, still at the top there, 130,772, passing 2 million copies sold already in Japan. That, that is very fast, but it's Pokemon, it sells, so it's expected there. Mario Party Superstars was number two, 53,824. That's coming up on half a million sold in Japan alone already. Big Brain Academy, Brain vs. Brain, 33,092. Then we have Minecraft, Animal Crossing, New Horizons, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, Momotaro Dentetsu, Ring Fit Adventure, and Pokemon Sword and Shield. Moving over to the hardware, this is, I think, where the big story is a lot of people were focusing in on. We have the Switch OLED model at the top, 90,076. The Switch regular, like, red box model, 59,460. And then the Switch Lite, 42,000. 799, so shy of 200,000 units, but still pretty good all the way around for the Switch. Then we get to the PlayStation 5, just over a thousand units. It, it is coming up to a million sold for the disc-based PlayStation 5, but yeah, just a thousand PlayStation 5 disc-based units selling. I mean, right below that is the Xbox Series X at 450 units, and we don't expect Microsoft to do much of anything in Japan. 
And then we see the new 2DS LL391, the Xbox Series S355, and then with the PlayStation 5 Digital Edition, barely outselling the PlayStation 4, by the way, at 113 units. And looking at those PlayStation 5 numbers, yeah, there is an issue here. And a lot of people are looking at this saying, wait, is Sony even sending PlayStation 5 systems to Japan? Because from the outside, it sort of looks like they're just taking focus away from Japan and placing on other regions like the US or in Europe. Now, Sony does very well in Europe. Uh, it's well documented in all the different sales starts, specifically in like the UK sales starts and others. In the US, they do very well, but in Japan, I mean, Sony's a, a Japanese company. You figured they would want to do at least somewhat well in Japan, but it's like the stock is certainly being diverted to other regions. Again, at least that's what it looks like from the outside. We know there is a massive chip shortage going on, but all the companies would be having issues with that. And that does include Nintendo and it could affect them more as we head into 2022. Maybe they have stockpiled chips and prepared for it. And when they have to come back around to doing more orders, okay, now switches are having an issue getting to store shelves, but like just over a thousand PlayStation 5 selling in what's a really busy time of year for consumer products, the holidays going on is uh, surprising, I would say. I, I thought it had hit like rock bottom last week, but it looks like it's just getting worse. So, I mean, we'll find out a bit more next week as well, but this could be one of the worst holidays we've ever seen from Sony in Japan, which of course makes you wonder about these different Japanese developers and publishers and which platform they're really gonna be targeting in the coming years. You think of like Bandai, Square, Falcom, and many others. So that's something else to keep in mind. If the Switch continues to be this massive runaway success of claiming 99% of the market in Japan, then those developers have no choice but to either go to Sony and get money from them to fund the projects or just focus as the Switch being their primary system to develop for. But I guess we'll find out more in the coming weeks and as we head into 2022. Next up, let's talk about a bit of a strange situation where a game is so successful that you as a company have to stop selling it, at least for the time being. And that's Final Fantasy XIV. We can see this tweet that was posted up by the official Final Fantasy XIV account saying, we'd like to share an update from Final Fantasy XIV producer and director Yoshida on the ongoing congestion, additional game time compensation, suspension of sales, error codes, and our upcoming plans. So what's going on here is Final Fantasy XIV had Endwalker, of course, release, and it's massively popular. Final Fantasy XIV, I see it all over Twitter. People are talking about it a ton. It, of course, won like best ongoing game, community support, all these different things from different outlets. So it's in the headlines. People are really flocking to this game, checking it out but they're also flocking to what's a queue of 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 players just in line so they can try to get into the game and play it, which of course has led Square and the developers to try to figure out ways to make this work. And you'd be thinking, well, why don't they just get more servers? I mean, they already thought of that. Here's the problem. We just talked, talked about the chip shortage. Guess what they're facing? a lack of servers because of the chip shortage. So at this time, they mentioned we're gonna be phasing in these sales suspensions over the next few days until we can get this under control. And uh, wow, what a, what a problem to be dealing with, right? Your game is just so popular that people can't get into the game to play it. It's, um, it, it's something else. I, like I said, I see a lot of people posting up pictures of the queue they're waiting in and it's just like they're sitting there waiting for this number to tick down from the thousands into the hundreds until finally it says zero and they can jump in and they'll just leave it on their computer screen and kind of do other things while they're waiting. I mean, in one end, it's like congratulations to Final Fantasy 14, but then it's like, what a shame. They have all the success, but they can't find the servers to continue running with this success. Uh, we'll see how this continues to uh, transpire again as we go along, especially through the holidays. There'll be a lot of people building PCs, a lot of people hopefully getting PlayStation 5 systems and trying to log into this really cool game they saw online called Final Fantasy 14, where they get to stand in line for a while until they can finally get in and play it. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about that Power On documentary series covering Xbox and basically them starting up this brand within Microsoft that was known for Office products. 
But there was another really interesting fact that came out of this and really how Microsoft dealt with the Wii because we had talked about before how the Wii really caught everyone's attention. That includes Sony and Microsoft. They both kind of came out with their own peripherals that was sort of a response to what the Wii was able to do, which was bring in a large mainstream audience that had not typically gone out and bought a game system. Sure, they mostly played Wii Sports, but the Wii still at least got them looking into games overall. Well, we can see this here from Phil Spencer going over Bill Gates and how he was actually frustrated that Microsoft, uh, specifically the Xbox division, did not see any of this coming. He says, I remember Bill putting a lot of pressure on the Xbox leadership team. How do we miss motion gaming? What can we do? to catch up. Now, Nintendo Life also pointed out that uh, CEO of Sony Computer Entertainment, Jack Tretton, mentioned Nintendo as well, saying Nintendo came out of left field with a device that wasn't based on technology. It was based on a simple entertainment experience of being able to play a game without being a button masher on a controller. Clearly, they expanded the audience and they took gaming to mainstream entertainment. Now, the thing is kind of funny about this is, of course, their response was the Kinect, which did well. It sold over 30 million units on the 360. And at the time when it came out, a lot of people were going out buying the Kinect and using it at home with the basic games. It didn't really, I would say, evolve into the best peripheral or controller you could use, whether it's the Star Wars game or Steel Battalion or like these other games that just never felt like you were actually in control of it. But it evolved into the next Kinect that came packaged with the Xbox One, making it more expensive than the PlayStation 4. So while they found success with the Xbox Connect on the 360 initially, it certainly did not help them with the Xbox One. In fact, it made that entire launch even worse. So it worked well in the 360, not so much with the Xbox One. And before we go to the comment of the day, we'll take a little poll that I posted up yesterday, where I asked, have you played the original Splinter Cell before? 61% said no, 39% said yes. Well, it was a while ago. This was like 2002, I believe. And you think about that now in terms of where we are, that's 19 years ago. So there's a lot of people who just completely missed out on the original one. And it makes sense, as I said before, why we see so many remakes and remasters because I'll run these polls. And it's very clear that a lot of people just missed these games. And you know what? Splinter Cell, I think, would be really cool on newer platforms with a full remake, especially if you put like the talent like Ubisoft Toronto behind it. I just get concerned with Ubisoft and what they could potentially do to not just this game, but the Splinter Cell series in the future. So I guess we'll see how this one turns out and then we'll kind of go from there. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Sky saying, so Nintendo is patenting Bullet Time, Braid, Prince of Persia, Sands of Time, and Out of Bounds glitches, uh, mechanics behind ghosts from Dark Souls. What a great place video games patenting is right now. The things that have been around for literally decades are being patented. Well, that that's not completely correct. Now, we've talked about patents before, and I feel like people look at a patent and they're like, it's just this broad umbrella in general. And these companies, Nintendo, Microsoft, Sony, all of them, they patent all kinds of stuff. Stuff in game and out of game, peripherals, everything, right? To protect their ideas and even if they're not gonna use it, just to make sure their, their bases are covered. But the, the difference here with some of these patents that we, like for example, just talked about, and probably the reason you didn't see a lot of people like annoyed or frustrated with them, they're very specific. And that's the biggest thing here. Look, we're gonna see patents all over the place. It's just how bad is the patent in terms of uh, how, how vague it is overall or how broad it is. When you see something like the Nemesis system, it's very broad. Like the problem we're gonna run into is smaller developers are going to avoid something that sounds even a little bit like it or may use one element that they're not sure of when it comes to the social engagement or pathfinding of uh, the Strand system that was patented. Whereas Nintendo broke it down very clearly that they were patenting different uh, algorithms, mechanics used to pass through an object or rewind time. Not the mechanic itself rewinding time or passing through an object, just how they were going to accomplish it in this Breath of the Wild 2 game that we assume they're gonna be using all of this in. I think that's the biggest difference there is if a patent is very specific, 
like how Sony is going to emulate some of their uh, older legacy systems, people are like, okay, that makes sense why he'd patent that. But when it's very broad with the Nemesis system, it becomes very frustrating because it will stifle creativity overall. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. It really helps out. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today. Whereas the PlayStation 5 in Japan, are you surprised to see these numbers so low? And do you think they're taking the stock and moving it to other parts of the world? Maybe they can recover in Japan in 2022. Let me know about that. And then also, what about Persona 4 Golden? Do you think it will go to the Switch and PlayStation 4 here pretty soon? And then let me know if you're someone who's been dealing with the whole queue in Final Fantasy 14 and your thoughts of how popular it's become and them even having to slow sales, at least in, in the short term. Thanks guys for watching. Have a great weekend. I'll see you back here Monday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern time for Newswave.